plastics in the fight against AMR. My name is Renu Kagade, and I am with CHAI, the Clinton Health Access Initiative. And joining me today is a group of expert panelists who, will, who you will meet shortly. But just reflecting on the topic, the crucial role of diagnostics in the fight against AMR. One of my mentors used to say very elegantly that diagnostics is the Cinderella that never gets invited to the ball. Um, and I think we want to make sure that that's not the case, that we always reflect on the role of diagnostics um, as much of the discussion is around um, antibiotics. Um, I think this group knows it, but uh, just a reminder that ever since the World Health Assembly endorsed the Global Action Plan to tackle AMR in 2015, every year the global community comes together for a week in November with the aim to raise awareness among general public, um, policymakers, healthcare providers, um, to make sure that we are collectively tackling AMR, stopping the spread of an emergence of new infections. This year's theme is spread awareness and stop resistance. And the panelists will just reflect on um, all of those thoughts. Uh, but when I reflect on my own personal experiences in global health, I always say that several forces need to be aligned to tackle complex global health problems such as AMR. Couldn't be more complex, right? It involves multiple sectors, uh, multiple challenges, and it is a global problem. Um, I would often simplify and say, um, all the P's need to be aligned. You need to have the right product, the right price, at the right place, the right policy, the right procurement. Um, and all of these forces need to be in place. Um, and Global Health has many experiences which will endorse that kind of model. But at the center and core of all of this is people um, and why we're doing it. So what better way to start off this discussion um, than to have a personal story from an AMR survivor. We're very fortunate that Vanessa was able to record her journey um, to share it with us today. Uh, let's have that video before we get to the panel uh, panelists. So um, if we can show Vanessa's video, please. Hi, my name is Vanessa and um... I uh, am a patient advocate for antimicrobial resistance. Um, I had a severe car accident when I was 25 years old, back in 2004. And uh, basically what happened was I smashed most of the bones on the right side of my face. I had other injuries as well, but these were the most complicated that had to be reconstructed. And um, this went on for many years. Um, in my sixth year, I had a alloplastic, it's a type of a substrate, um, implant prosthetic that was that was put into my face um, to kind of make it seem more natural looking and about two weeks after I had this implant inserted I got an infection so I went to my doctor and they said uh, you know you got an infection we need to get you into emergency um, surgery and um, you know we'll see from there and so we did the emergency surgery and two weeks later the infection came back again but it looked even worse so we went back again, we did the debridements, we did um, what we call reconstructive surgery to try and fix the um, eyelid area. And two weeks later, the infection would come back again. But I was also under the care of different doctors. So it wasn't just a plastic surgeon, it was an ENT surgeon, it was a maxillofacial surgeon, it was a um, ocularist, an ophthalmologist. I was getting antibiotics prescribed by all of them. You know, so, so this basically went on for about 11 months. I had about four or five surgeries in that time to try and salvage this prosthetic that seemed to be infected. Um, until finally, towards the 11 months, the plastic surgeon, you know, stood forward and said, um, I'm going to take this prosthetic out if I see the infection is still on there. It prompted me to phone the pathologist offices for the tests. And um, for the first time, I saw this, you know, on the top of the test, it said MRSA. And a whole list of R's and S's going down the A4 sheet of paper, basically explaining the different antibiotics that I was now either resistant or susceptible to. In other words, they either worked or they didn't. And there were probably about four or five that were still working for me. And of course, as a patient, what I was doing was I would sort of stop antibiotics halfway saying, you know, um, this antibiotic isn't working. I need to go see my other doctor. 
what is going on. So it was, it was, I was working very blindly and I felt the doctors were working very blindly as well when they were prescribing antibiotics. I had by then had such a very bad deficit in my face because of the bacterial infection. And uh, the doctors had given up hope on me because they didn't think they could reconstruct the face. Having this diagnostic test in front of me, I knew I couldn't make any more bad decisions as a patient. So I started um, researching for the best doctors I could find. We did the surgery. We did have an infection return as well as an allergy. Um, we rotated antibiotics and then finally over a three month period rotating antibiotics and my strict adherence to RPC uh, infection control, strict adherence to adherence of um, you know, taking antibiotics when I was supposed to be that five in the morning, it didn't matter. It eventually cleared. And so uh, I think the moral of the story for me is I have many different segments of my story that mean different things. You know, one thing is multi-sectoral care, holistic care and primary health care, um, managing an infection. But I think a very, very strong foundation of that is a diagnostic test. I think if my doctors had had that information between themselves, it would have made a very big difference to the way they were, were prescribing antibiotics to me. But also for me as a patient, knowing, um, you know, what was going on, you know, going back again, MRSA was not common knowledge to me. Antibiotic resistance was not common knowledge to me. So I couldn't play a role in my part. I couldn't go home and, and, and really know what it was I needed to do without really understanding that. Um, and I think as patients, um, this is very ex important because, for example, if you got cold or flu or COVID and so on, and you're demanding an antibiotic, you do it. I think generally from a place where um, you don't really know what's going on with you, but if you if you walked into your doctor's office and your doctor said, "Well, you know, I, let's let's do a quick, you know test at my desk to see exactly what this is—is is this bacterial, is this viral?" You know, putting it in black and white as I had in front of me, you can make more informed decisions. Yeah, so I I, I think that diagnostics are vitally important. I can't understand why it's not an everyday thing that happens before any antibody is um, prescribed. So thank you. So just reflecting on Vanessa's video, so many key takeaways. It can happen to anyone. Um, it's not only for certain select populations. Um, it can be terrible, as we've seen, um, the need for raising public awareness, awareness among health workers. Uh, but at the end of her story is also hope. She's a survivor and she's spreading the message. So before we go on to our dialogue, I'm going to ask each panelist to quickly introduce yourself in just a couple of minutes and the organization you represent. Um, and then we'll start our discussion. We'll start with you, Kitty, um, in the order that I see on my screen. So Kitty, Dave, Alan, and Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Renuka. Uh, well, I'm the a director of the SP, SPC department of the AMR division, and SPC stands for uh, Surveys, Prevention, and Control. Um, we are a cross-cutting division because there are so many aspects to uh, AMR that has to be dealt with um, in collaboration with others. So we work very closely with um, the medicines department. Uh, primary healthcare, UHC, TB, malaria, HIV, and of course, across the three levels of the organization. So our department is really focusing on a surveillance of AMR and surveillance of antimicrobial use and consumption um, to inform action at country level. The evidence base for uh, AMR interventions at the country level, especially at um, low and middle income countries is very limited. So we are investing more and more on um, evidence generation. And currently we are developing a human health um, a research agenda. The same team is also uh, focusing on the diagnostic pathway, not just um, the laboratory strengthening and the network strengthening, but also all the other hurdles that patients are facing. Um, in addition, um, well, in fact, last but not least, um, one of our units is focusing on um, assisting countries with the developing the development costing um, uh, implementation and evaluation of national action plan. We want a national action plan for AMR of a new uh, generations 
that are evidence-based, prioritized, costed, and uh, implemented in a program, programmatic uh, manner with the patient as one of our partners. This is why we are developing the patient pathway um, because the, the patient should be our, our uh, partner in crime to find, uh, find AMR and give AMR a face and a voice. Obviously, and this is where I will end, we cannot do this alone as a WHO. So um, we are setting up the AMR technical assistance mechanism uh, with already 60 partners from all over the world joining us in our efforts to uh, support countries. Thank you. Great, Kitty. And um, next panelist, please go ahead. Dave. Oh, okay. Sorry, Renuka. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Dave Rippen, I'm Chief Science Officer and Head of Infectious Disease Programs at Clinton Health Access Initiative. Uh, CHAI has been um, around for about 20 years, um, initially focusing on HIV and, and really having worked in, on a number of infectious conditions, including malaria, TB, where management of resistance is absolutely critical. Uh, CHAI focuses in parallel um, at the country level in supporting uh, national programs and the private sector recognized by those national programs uh, to uh, most effectively deliver care to patients. And at the global level, um, ensuring that um, all of the best uh, treatments and diagnostics are accessible and available to those treatment programs. I think on a, a personal note, and I think most people would fall into this category, um, while it's, it's trivial relative to the speaker who introduced the session, um, I, I will say I've uh, experienced uh, a few um, resistant infections of my own, including a post-operative MERS infection and a, a C. diff infection, which I think uh, honestly was probably the closest to death I've ever come. So um, it's a deeply personal issue as well as one which is uh, important uh, to us uh, as an organization. And I look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you, Dave. Again, thank you for sharing your story as well. Um, moving on to Bill and then Alan. Uh, thanks, Renuka, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, wherever you are. Um, you know, before I introduce myself, I just want to give a word of acknowledgement to uh, my fellow panelists. We have, um, you know, Kitty Van Wiesenbeek from WHO, Dave Rippon from Chai, and Alan Donnelly from H20, who'll introduce himself. And I think it's a great collection of um, organizations and individuals who really care about this important topic. So I appreciate everyone's coming together today. And thank you, Renuka, for really pulling us together and making this happen during uh, uh, World Antibiotic Awareness Week. Um, my name is Bill Rodriguez. I'm the CEO at FIND. We're the Global Alliance for Diagnostics, and FIND's mission is to ensure that there's equitable access to diagnostic tests for everyone in the world. Uh, many of the participants here probably first learned about FIND in the past 18 months when we've been the co-convener of the diagnostics pillar of, of ACT-A, uh, where depending on the day, we've either been immersed or overrun by the challenges of uh, making sure that there's equitable access to high quality COVID tests worldwide. Um, if you know of us before COVID, that was likely from our work uh, doing very similar work over two decades, like Chai, we've been around for about two decades in tuberculosis or malaria or Ebola, trying to make sure there's equitable access to testing. In fact, today we work across seven different disease areas, including TB, hepatitis, malaria, the neglected tropical diseases and non-communicable diseases. And then of course, pandemic threats and antimicrobial resistance. And we work across the diagnostics uh, life cycle. We invest in early stage R&D for new testing technologies, new test platforms. And our work um, really runs the gamut from product development to clinical trials, to regulatory clearance, policy development as a World Health Organization collaborating center where we feed um, evidence to policymakers at WHO, um, as well as market innovations and access programs to increase access to testing. And we support operational research and impact elevation, so really end-to-end -end work in diagnostics. Um, and in the context of, of antimicrobial resistance, we've had a program now for several years uh, 
focused on the tools that we need to make sure that antibiotics are used appropriately at clinic level, at hospital level, a level in, in our surveillance work. And I'll talk more about that a little later. Thanks. Thanks, Renuka. Thanks, Bill. And Alan, over to you. Th thanks very much, uh, Renuka. And uh, I'm pleased to be on the, the panel with uh, colleagues. Um, and also, I'd like to thank FIND for um, organizing uh, today's event. Um, I chair the G20 Health and Development Partnership, which is a not-for-profit not for organization that was um, set up uh, in uh, 2017 with the help of Angela Merkel when she became uh, president of the G20. And we've tried to bring together global players around the world um, from uh, the not-for-profit sector, the private sector, academia, to uh, elevate health of the political agenda uh, within G20 and G7 countries. And um, I, I really do feel that uh, there's been a lot of progress made um, because of this collaborative work, because of this new partnership, to make uh, politicians understand the uh, importance of health and health system resilience to the performance of their economies. And of course, we're now seeing it massively because of COVID-19. But um, I'd also like to pass on the apologies of Dr. Hyatt Sindhi, who's the chief scientist from the Islamic Development Bank, but she sadly uh, was um, is poorly and she was un unable to join us, but she does send everyone uh, her best wishes. Thank you so much, um, Alan, and it's great to have you, um, you know, on this panel and you bring a wealth of expertise and experiences on how you can influence uh, challenging issues with stakeholders who are very important and how funding can flow. So thank you for joining us. I'll start my questions with Kitty. I mean, it's almost, you have after almost 40 years in international TV control joined WHO as the Director for AMR Surveillance Prevention and Control. And my question to you is what lessons and learnings from TB can you apply for AMR, recognizing that MDR TB is very much an AMR problem, but recognizing that AMR is certainly broader than TB. Thank you for the question, Renuka. Well, um, I, can, I can speak on this for one hour and this is not what you want, so I will have to focus. Um, of course, AMR is, with all its disease syndromes, is far more complicated than TB, but we can learn a lot from TB, but not only from the achievements, also from the mistakes. And uh, just to put it in perspe perspective, uh, I've worked on TB, especially MDR-TB and well, drug resistant TB in over 30 countries. So uh, I come with a lot of programmatic experience, and I think this is one of the most important lessons that I think that the approach to AMR has been often very fragmented, focusing on stewardship um, and uh, not really looking at the six building blocks that we need for AMR. And one of the building blocks, very important access to early and quality uh, diagnosis is not um, highlighted in the 2015 um, AMR Global Action Plan. And we need to change that. Um, so, uh, but before going there, I want to, uh, uh, before going into the learnings, I want to share one important thing. One thing we did wrong in TB, we have been too modest for decades. We had to work, wait for 40 years to get a new drug and far longer to get us um, a more sensitive diagnostic. And if it comes to drug resistant TB, you have to wait for months to get a result. Um, and when finally a game changing tool was uh, introduced, uh, like the gene expert, we were not ready for that. And a lot of people said, it's too expensive. We cannot use it everywhere. And uh, I, th I think that really um, delayed our response. So I think for AMR, uh, it's, a, it's a huge public health threat. It's an economic threat. Uh, things started to change for, uh, with TB. Um, and of course, thanks to the Global Fund and USAID, when we made a very clear investment case. This is what we need for AMR. We need an investment case. We, have, we need to make clear what the cost of inaction uh, is. 
Um, so coming back to the diagnostic pathway, I think this is crucial. And uh, we have to, what we can learn from TB that we should not just focus on a tool or a, an individual laboratory. We really need to, to uh, focus on the whole patient pathway and a laboratory network approach that comes with, uh, of course, um, the, the quality of the test, but it also comes with the supply chain. We have a lot of countries now um, warning us that they cannot have access to reagents it comes with external quality control. It comes with access to a test. And in fact, so just to give you an example, in some even European countries, um, the, the, the a diagnostic test is far more expensive than treating somebody with a reserve antimicrobial that you don't want to use. So this whole access issue is a reason to, to really look at the patient pathway uh, in a country specific manner what are the hurdles to access um, um, diagnosis, financial hurdles, um, infrastructure hurdles, and what needs to be done to really build laboratory and uh, uh, microbiology networks with the right tools at the right level. And to just to end my comment, this comes back to the modesty. If I'm thinking of new tools coming up, the pipeline of new uh, diagnostics, uh, for instance, uh, uh, distinguishing um, a viral infection from a bacterial infection, we, and this is our job as WHO with partners, to start thinking now whether and how such a tool could be uh, used in low and middle income countries and high income countries because AMR is um, um, uh, a worldwide. Um, uh, so we need to, to come with. A, policy development, operational implementation research, and really think ahead and not just wait for it to come and then not know what to do. So I, I think we cannot be modest. We have to move with all aspects of the AMR response. And that's what we should learn from TB that um, was too modest for years. Thank you. Very well articulated, Katie. And I think several key takeaways will we'll summarize at the end, but this early access to quality diagnostics, which is not part of the plan. And thank you for calling out that challenge right there. Um, but I think some of the issues that you spoke about very well resonate with several of the panelists here, but let's move to Bill to say, um, you know, you spoke about find strategy and you spoke about the focus on AMR and many disease states that find um, focuses on. Um, so how is your AMR strategy cutting across these different areas? What can you tell us about FINE's AMR strategy, Bill? Well, thanks, Renuka. And um, I really appreciate Kitty's leadership and Hanabalki's leadership at WHO because um, we actually have learned an enormous amount from TB and not just TB, from malaria and many other diseases in addressing AMR, uh, including primary health care and how to roll out health care, financing, the economics of health care coverage. Um, public health surveilling systems, data management. So all of those things are lessons we've learned and we need to apply to the AMR our challenge. And that's what we're trying to do at, um, at FIND. There's a, there's a social theorist named Paul Brest um, who has a framework that I like very much for AMR. He divides the world into big cube and small cube problems. And the small cube problems are things that are tractable and measurable and you can address them in a year or two years and, and, and demonstrate outcomes. But big cube problems are much more intractable. They're cross cutting, they're hard to measure. And, and sort of the classic big cube problem is climate change, right? You have to break it down into smaller cubes like electrifying rural villages is, is one measure that can help address climate change, but it's hard to take on the whole thing at once. And I think of AMR as a big cube problem. And so the strategy that we're pursuing at FIND, learning from TB and malaria and NTDs and, and hepatitis and HIV is to break it down into these um, smaller cube problems. So. So the way we're thinking about it is really in three um, different categories. And this is under the leadership of Cecilia Ferreira, who runs our, our um, AMR program at FIND. So the first is at the community and clinic level, how do we preserve the appropriate use? How do we preserve existing antibiotics by making sure they're used appropriately? And how do we support the rollout of new antibiotics? And, and we have a number of programs that are, that are meant to guide outpatient management of um, children and adults presenting with fever who, as we all know, um, everywhere in the, in the world, in every clinic, in every village, in every town, in every province, in every country, um, it's hard when those people walk into a clinic to not 
um, administer antibiotics, right? That's the challenge everywhere. So it's not a problem um, in any one part of the world. It's a problem everywhere. And it's especially true when you've got a patient, um, uh, you know, who's walked for hours and sits on a bench in a clinic for three hours because they're sick and they've taken a day off from work and their children need childcare. And then they're come and told, well, you know, we're not sure what it is, but we don't think you need antibiotics, right? If they don't get an injection, an injection, they're angry because they've just sacrificed. So we need to come up with the tools that can support them. So just two examples I'll give you of what we're working on um, at the community and clinic level. One is a project led by Sabina Dietrich of our fever malaria program called the um, AMR Diagnostic Use Accelerator. It's a study of 22,000 patients across uh, five countries looking at um, training for the, the health workers as well as a series of clinical um, uh, uh, signs and, and um, pathogen specific rapid tests, as well as treatment algorithms to see if we can design a system that can be used there that can appropriately administer antibiotics to the right patient in the right, in the right setting. And that, that study is ongoing and, and enrollment is wrapping up and we should be able to report um, really good outcomes on what's the appropriate use of different tools to help manage febrile patients at the community level. Um, a, second, a second project is, is simply having a simple rapid test for gonorrhea and chlamydia that can identify the need for um, uh, alternative antibiotics and being able to use that at the primary care level for STIs like, like gonorrhea and chlamydia. So those are two examples of a number of projects where we're focused on how do we help clinicians at the community level administer appropriate antibiotics um, to patients who really expect them when they arrive. The second project is at the hospital level, which is we all know um, where a lot of um, difficult antibiotic decisions are made. And so we're working to develop new rapid um, tests for bloodstream infections that can do pathogen identification and uh, AST or susceptibility testing for antibiotics that can really limit the, the use of broad spectrum antibiotics and narrow down the use of antibiotics to the appropriate patient um, with the appropriate infection. And those are new platforms that we're supporting and investing in. And then third um, is at the public health level, where as, as we all um, know, and as Kitty mentioned, we need strong surveillance mechanisms. We wanna empower decentralized um, surveillance for antimicrobial resistance, including sequencing where it's appropriate. We've been able to um, leverage the investments in sequencing for COVID over the past two years to really help roll out better surveillance systems for bacterial pathogens and identifying um, uh, resistant genotypes and building the database to support their use uh, broadly for surveillance. So that's just a couple of examples um, at these three different levels, the community level, the, the hospital level, and then at the public health surveillance level. And as I mentioned before, Renuka, I think it's really great that you've um, brought together um, Deborah Cho, Find, Chai, um, and then Alan from H20 representing finance ministers and health ministers, because it's in collaborating about these projects, we're really gonna be able, across institutions that work in different aspects of this, that we're really gonna be able to see these new tools be used appropriately and rolled out appropriately in the right setting. Thanks, Bill. Again, some very, very pertinent um, comments here, and I love the way you broke the big cube into smaller um, cubes for uh, action. I, in just hearing you and then hearing Kitty, I think both of you touched upon interesting aspects. One is access, and one is, you know, how do you bring in uh, appropriate technologies? And it would be nice to pivot then to Dale, um, who has a ton of experience in both addressing both these issues, and Chai works across almost all elements of the healthcare um, delivery uh, system as well. And what's your vision on AMR and where do you see the role of diagnostics and also having heard the previous two panelists? Yeah, I mean, having heard the previous two panelists, a, a lot of what I have to say will uh -huh. seem a bit repetitive, but I, I think, you know, we, we start by being quite focused on, and we've heard this referred to the patient pathway um, which is going to vary depending on syndrome. And I'll come back to syndromes in, in a moment. Um, but Renuka, you started by um, alluding to the idea of having the right test at the right place, the right price. Um, it needs to support the right decision for the place. And so, you know, if we assume that care is going to begin at the community level, and I think we all agree on that, then it's important to think about the um, diagnostic algorithms that uh, a community health worker could reasonably follow and think about which diagnostics we can deliver 
which in a reasonable amount of uh, time and effort uh, lead to a decision either to presumptively treat or to escalate a patient in, in care. Um, and I think in making sure that the diagnostic tests we develop and make accessible match the health delivery capabilities of the system at different levels, that is going to help us really focus on developing those right tests for the right place. Um, I, I think secondly, AMR is not an issue which is going to be solved by um, uh, just uh, inventing new antibiotics until uh, the end of time and improving access for them. Uh, really, we're going to solve, we're going to address AMR if we focus on the combination of appropriate diagnosis and treatment. And so we have to think about um, financial incentives and financial models which make products accessible that are both uh, treatment and diagnostic from first line to last line. Um, you know, a lot has been uh, recognized about the fact that a lot of inappropriate treatment with uh, more sophisticated later line antibiotics happens because it's more difficult to access some of the uh, first line antibiotics, which uh, have become so inexpensive that suppliers are actually exiting the market space. And I think only if we think about solving all of these problems at the same time, access to underpriced first line therapies, access to uh, later line antibiotics, which are more expensive, and access to uh, the appropriate diagnostics to support the use of those antibiotics and put, put all of those together in one combined solution, are we going to come up with a system which incentivizes an appropriate treatment pathway? Um, uh, I think, you know, as, as Chai, we very much focus on beginning at the ground level up. I think it's important to think syndromically um, because ultimately patients who um, are having different symptoms or uh, not having symptoms as the case may be, are going to enter the health system in different places and therefore um, a different series of tests and decisions are going to be made for them. Um, in some cases, such as STIs, which Bill has highlighted, um, you know, really our best defense against AMR is prevention. Um, and prevention is going to start by finding patients who are asymptomatic or early in their illness. And, and this brings me to a, a final issue I think we really need to focus on beyond the development of the diagnostics themselves and the new tools, which is to think um, systematically about sampling um, and non-invasive, simple to collect samples, um, which can uh, allow us to diagnose more individuals with more conditions earlier, and to think about the right time for those samples to be taken. Um, uh, I think too often, and even in my own experience, you find that uh, a patient pathway that begins with presumptive treatment uh, ends up with an inability to ultimately diagnose the original illness because uh, samples weren't collected in an appropriate time such that uh, health system could uh, then go on to diagnose uh, both the condition and disease susceptibility. Finally, I think, um, you know, if we can focus on a single lab system, which converges the needs of surveillance programs and the needs of a patient care system delivering results for patient provider-based decisions, I think we're gonna end up making much more uh, efficient investments. And I think we'll end up with a lot more data in our surveillance networks as a result. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And I think um, your, your comment on how can you create financial incentives and packages that address both diagnostics and treatment in one bucket is, is spot on and sets the perfect segue to Alan, um, you know, I have witnessed and seen the impact that you and your groups have, Alan, in global health. And so given your involvement with the G20 Health and Finance Committee, can you talk a bit about what donors and politicians need to consider in terms of financing mechanisms and AMI? What's going on in that space? Well, you know, one of the, one of the critical things that we have to address, Renuka, is um, we've got to give politicians 
um, examples of what actually works. And so one of the things we've been doing over the last um, three or four years is we've been getting some of our partners to meet health ministers and meet the chief medical officers from the G20 countries to show them exemplars of success. And for many ministers, you have to understand that if you're a health minister or a finance minister, it's highly unlikely you'll either be an expert in health or finance. You've just been given the job by your president or your prime minister, and you count on the civil servants around you to guide you through the process. And so what many of the ministers have said to us over the last few years is, look, show us what works at a micro level. Show us what we can finance um, at a, a micro or a national or a regional level, and we will then take some of those issues forward. And that's one of the great things about the ACT Accelerator initiative that um, Bill mentioned earlier for vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics in relation to COVID-19, where many of our, in fact, all of our partners play a leading role in those three pillars. Um, but I want to focus on some, something very specific and very concrete. We've been arguing um, since uh, 2017 that there needs to be a permanent mechanism for health and finance ministers to meet, to look at the long-term financing of health, of health system resilience and health systems, and of course, more latterly in, in terms of pandemic preparedness. Now, our approach didn't start with COVID-19. Uh, this approach started back um, at the beginning of 2019, before anyone had heard of COVID-19. And this was to bring a mechanism together where we can look properly at how we finance uh, major initiatives that are uh, uh, an existential threat to mankind and to, to humanity. And of course, we've got climate change, which Bill mentioned earlier, uh, where there are initiatives now to try and tackle that. Um, particularly a financing mechanism to help low and middle income countries. But we've argued very strongly that there needs to be a proper financing mechanism to, uh, to tackle those uh, pandemics, including antimicrobial resistance, that, that are increasingly a threat to humanity. And so what we argued strongly for this year with the Italian presidency was the create and creation of the finance and health task force, which has now been set up. And in the last few weeks, we've been in discussions with the Indonesian government and the Italian government who've got to put some meat on the bones of this initiative. So is it going to be a talking shop? Well, let me tell you the things that we want this finance and health uh, ministers um, task force to deal with. We want to pick up Kitty's point where we want there to be coordination of national action plans on AMR, and that we have a proper exchange of best practice among G20 governments and beyond, and identify coll collaborative uh, opportunities uh, for uh, public-private partnerships, and also for new blended finance initiatives. Now, Chai and Find, and I'm sure others listening to this, will know of examples like that. And what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that these are fed in to these ministerial meetings and this new task force so that uh, they can be, uh, this, this best practice can be used elsewhere uh, within, the, uh, within the global community. We do need long-term investments and predictable investments and AMR research and development included, including in diagnostics. And if you listen to Vanessa's film at the beginning, my goodness, you know, don't we need investment um, in, this, uh, in this space. But what we need to do is we need to publish national roadmaps to implement incentives and uh, market reforms for antibiotic and for diagnostic production um, so that we can have year-on-year -year analysis of what is happening in this space and it's being properly monitored. And then I think we do need, and it will be calling for this when the new task force is established. We need a permanent pull incentive as part of this global financing mechanism for health, that this should be adopted either at national level or regional 
levels like within the EU or within the Islamic community, and that each uh, G20 country should provide its fair share in all of this. Now, the, we, we've had the catastrophe of, of COVID-19, which, you know, best estimates suggest probably at the moment has cost 15 trillion dollars within G20 countries. We know that we're facing another catastrophe if we do not finance, that we do not organize ourselves properly when it comes to antimicrobial resistance with the proper diagnostic tools to tackle it. The cost of investing in this now is massively lower than the cost of having another COVID-19 type pandemic. And that's why collectively, Renuka, we've got to work together, the organizations on this panel, but also those listening, to lobby heavily with this new health and finance ministers panel task force to make sure that the resources and mechanisms are in place. The final thing I want to say is the point that a number of panelists have made about data management and surveillance. We've got to have a proper multilateral surveillance procedure for, for uh, antimicrobial resistance and its, uh, its impact and the availability of diagnostics and therapeutics. Because if you can't measure it, as we know, you can't fix it. And the one thing we've learned from this latest pandemic of COVID-19 is that we need proper big data, which can be properly analyzed so we can monitor and we can respond um, effectively either at a micro level or at a macro level with this very, very serious challenge. So thank you, Alan, and I think you made some really interesting comments that your initiative about thinking of a long-term financing tool started even prior to COVID, and COVID only amplifies the need and the case even more, and you called upon action from both um, Find and Chai to kind of come together with case studies to strengthen that argument and that point, very well noted, and the need to have a very strong surveillance system that can um, like a metrics that can guide you um, and um, measurement so that you don't stop till you finish. I see Bill has a comment and I'd, I'd love for panelists to kind of weigh in on each other's comments as well. We have a few questions that we'll get. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. I, I'm glad we're recording this. I hope everyone has a chance to listen a second time to everything Alan just said because he made so many um, key cogent observations. The one I want to really focus on is the comment, um, Alan, that you made about how when we talk to health ministers and finance ministers and political leaders, they, they say, tell us what works, show us what works. And I think one of the opportunities we have now with COVID is there's so much attention now on this issue of the economic devastation of pandemics like COVID and like AMR and the challenge of AMR can and, and will be that we have their attention but we have to actually do things a little differently than we've done in the past. And so, for instance, we have all these great technologies in development, these um, you know, novel ways of detecting volatile gases and new imaging and nanopore sequencing. And we get very geeky and nerdy about how cool these technologies are and, and what a difference they're going to make. But, but health ministers and finance ministers don't respond to that, right? That's not what's going to save the day. It's going to be showing them evidence of a program that's economically sustainable and that actually delivers results on reducing antibiotic use and maintaining health outcomes, you know, at some reasonable economic cost and price. And that's why it's important that we all need to work together. Like I said, we can just focus in on our technical programs, but we need to be partnering across, um, you know, across our organizations to build demonstration projects that take technologies, take existing technologies and new technologies, bring them into new programmatic models and new financing models and deliver results. And that's going to take not one organization, but several organizations working together, and especially under the auspices of the WHO. That's what's going to actually get the attention of the finance ministers and the health ministers and get these programs funded in the long term, because um, we can't rely on COVID funding and on COVID attention to persist when the next big challenge like climate change or something else arises. And that's why I'm really excited for, for this session and the hope that we can all begin to, to work closely together on this issue um, over the next couple of years. Thank you, Bill. And some very strong comments there, but I'll, put, I'll kind of wrap them into a conclusion at a later point. I see Dave has his hand up as well as Kitty. So um, please feel free to speak up, Dave, and then Kitty. Sure. Um, 
so uh, I, I think, you know, responding to Alan, I, I think, Alan, you make an outstanding point. And if we look at areas where we've had successes, we've had uh, pretty high levels of market organization and convergence. So I look at HIV response, TB response, malaria, where we have um, Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, malaria. We had uh, PEPFAR. We had a massive investment by the South African government. And that um, organization in the market allowed buyers to take concerted action to achieve an impact. We don't have a global fund for AMR or for, for bacterial infections. And I think that's um, hurting us to some extent. If you think about, let's say, a creative solution um, like Australia took for uh, their hepatitis C response, where they said, I, I want to uh, create an incentive to find as many cases as possible without worrying about breaking the bank on treatment. They essentially created a, uh, a, a, a subscription model where the uh, diagnosis and treatment were connected with a, um, a capped cost. One could imagine for a given syndrome, a patient or a, a payer paying for a uh, one price for an appropriate cure, where everyone's financial incentives are aligned to use the least expensive, most available antibiotic supported by a timely diagnostic, um, which will tell us if uh, this is one of the rare cases where we need to use one of the more expensive later line antibiotics. But in the absence of a strong market organizing force such as a, um, a, a concerted fund, it's going to be very challenging to do that. And um, uh, you know, I think we see a massive investment in R&D, both for diagnostics and for new therapeutics. Um, it would be a shame not to invest in parallel in our delivery systems and have those new products delivered into a, a broken system or uh, an area where there's no system at all. Thank you, Dave. And let's move to Kitty to see what her reactions are on some of these comments. Yeah, thank you for the uh, discussion. It's really interesting to, to hear a different view from different angles. Um, just a quick reaction on the surveillance. Uh, surveillance is key, and uh, it's at the local level, at the national level, at, and at the global level. Uh, the problem is that because the diagnostic access to diagnosis and in fact having quality laboratory results is a problem, the routine surveillance uh, comes with results that cannot be e easily interpreted. Well, in fact, they cannot be interpreted, especially in low and middle income countries. This is why we are going to, we are working now on setting up uh, a national AMR surveys as we have been doing for other uh, diseases. Um, but at the same time, we should not forget that over 90% of the prescription is in the community. And um, this is also where we will expand our antimicrobial use surveys and uh, um, strengthening the antimicrobial consumption surveys, which is uh, rather non-existing in most parts of the world. Um, on the on the new tools, I, I think we, we can really learn from the pool procurement mechanisms that have been set up um, by TB and, and, and HIV. If you look at TB, the global drug facility is providing not only drugs, it's providing also the um, uh, uh, diagnostics and for AMR, it should also include um, IPC uh, um, commodities. And, and I, I think the pool, pool procurement needs to be something to keep in the back of our mind. Um, and the, a, a game-changing tool like the Gene Expert that has identified so many multi-drug resistant uh, TB patients, um, that could, not, that could never have happened without negotiations with the manufacturer involved and having preferential pricing. So I, th I think we really have to look at this pipeline that's coming and try to figure out with decent research what the added value is of certain tools, both in the community and in the hospital at which 
level of the health system. And one thing I haven't heard, and I really think that this is um, uh, not yet developed in AMR, is a digital solutions, uh, referral mechanisms. And uh, there's so many tools being used in the other disease programs that make life uh, easier for the healthcare workers and, and for the patients. I will leave it with this, that. Um, I'm sorry for talking too long, but uh, it's close to my heart. No, I, and I think, you know, I wish, like you said, Kitty, we could keep talking about these issues for a longer time. I see that we have 10 minutes left and some very, very thoughtful comments from the panelists. And there's one question here that says, we need rapid tests with rapid turnaround and uh, need for rapid diagnos diagnosis and prompt treatment of AMR infections. Um, I think they are re-emphasizing that need. Um, and I think several organizations are looking at rapid and digital um, as a way. But um, Alan, I see that you may have a comment here to make. Yeah, I, I, I want to um, just, uh, well, first of all, to, to pick up Bill's point. Um, and also the point by Dave. Um, Dave, you you know that the the new Clinton admin the new Clinton the new Biden administration sorry the new Biden administration is committing significant attention to these global health challenges, and they played an important part in us getting the finance and health ministers task force agreed during the. Um, uh, during the, the recent G20 uh, heads of government and health and finance ministers meeting. I mean, I, I would welcome the opportunity of working with you and others to go and talk to uh, the Biden administration about how we create a financing mechanism uh, for AMR, because I think it is absolutely essential that we have that, particularly, it, and it has to be the, the whole chain, which is uh, the research and development for di for diagnostics. It has to be research and development into new therapeutics, but it also has to be, we have to address the access issues. And I know that USAID have, have been concerned about that in relation to COVID-19. Um, the other point, just to pick up, is, Bill, is Bill's point. Um, you know, we, we, um, we know from talking to ministers, we've got to, We've got to present these exemplars in a very, in a very, and I say this as a former politician, a very simple format. In other words, um, when when someone, when a minister decides to invest in something, if it's a um, a pull mechanism that exists, or if it's a new blended finance mechanism, they it's not learning by doing. They see what has been achieved and they know that they, they can move ahead and do this. And we've got to play our part in supporting this. The final thing I just wanted to mention is we haven't got on to the food chain. And one of the things that um, you know I'm, I'm very, very concerned about is we're, we're talking about antibiotics for humans, but some of the horror stories I've heard in the last two years of the use of antibiotics in fish farming and, and in the food chain, um, are, are very, are very, very serious indeed for um, countries around the world, and we do need a one health approach to this. And so somehow we've got to bring the the uh, world food agencies into this, and also the people who are dealing with um, agriculture. Thank you, Alan. That was almost a question that someone has asked about one health, but I see Kitty also with her hand up. So Kitty, over to you. Yes. Um I'm very sure, but um, um, less than one quarter uh, of all national action plans are costed, let alone funded. They end up in a drawer or just fragmented implementation. So we developed uh, a multi-sectoral costing and budgeting tool that um, is a, a modeler. And I'm not going to explain tool, but it makes it, makes it a possible to really cost the program, a programmatic approach to, a, to the AMR response in a given country. Um, and it, it helps to prioritize what needs to be done, but not only that, it also, um, it becomes clear where you can get funding from other health initiatives that, because there's a lot ha happening in the field of IPC, um, data management, 
uh, insurance schemes uh, and other health programs. And I think uh, if we don't start to really make clear what it, what it costs to address AMR, then um, it's, it will take a long time before we uh, move quickly. So this tool is now accessible and has been within one half week downloaded 600 times and piloted in a number of countries, just for your information. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kitty. So I think we have five minutes left. I'd like to wrap this towards the end with a nice summary because there's so many key points that you all have made. But before that, I just want to do a very rapid uh, round questions. Each one gets a minute or less, actually. Um, if you had one wish list, it's very hard. This is a big cube, complex big cube. So, but if you had one thing that you want to change, what would that be? Start with Bill, Dave, Alan, and Kitty, and then I'd like to wrap up. Sure, thanks, Renuka. If I had one wish for the magic wand, I would have a, a virtual antibiogram with 100% coverage in 144 countries. What does that mean? Um, it means that in every country you'd have sequencing capabilities so that on a routine basis funded by, <laughs> um, by available recurrent sources, you'd be able to draw samples from the microbiology laboratories, the referral hospital, the national reference hospital, and, and sequence them and be able to submit them to a global database like GSAID. So we'd have sequence data, we'd be able to get phenotype, genotype correlations so that anywhere in the world, someone could have an app where they would just be able to log in and get data on each pathogen, gram positives and gram negatives, and what the local antibiotic resistance pattern is. And if we had that, it would also tell us that the system for surveillance is functioning quite well. There's recurrent funding going into MR, but actually clinicians would have a tool where at least they'd be able to be in making rational choices on how to approach um, uh, known infections. And even that is, is not something we have today, but it's something that we could uh, tangibly do in the next couple of years. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Dave. I mean, I think uh, coming back to the last uh, the last section, I, I'd really love to see a concerted investment in implementation um, uh, through the creation of a, uh, a global fund to to fight bacterial infections. Um, and I think uh, you know a a close second wish would be as much of a focus on. Uh, samples um, and sample collection as there is on the uh, diagnostic tool development as well. I'd like to go to um, Kitty and then I'll close with Alan. Well, I would be very happy if the, if the wishes of the others uh, would be, would be uh, <laughs> coming through. Um, for me, um, it's a really, um, um, getting an, a really programmatic, evidence-based, prioritized response at, at the country level. That takes into uh, account six building blocks. First of all, political commitment that comes with funding, that comes with human resources and, and, and with regulations. Second, early access to quality diagnosis. Third, access to appropriate treatment. Fourth, infection prevention and control. Fifth, uh, uninterrupted supply of everything that's necessary. And six, um, surveillance and, and a research. And that's, that's, that's a lot, but if we don't start working on country responses that are really comprehensive, we will move in one area, but not in another area. So I hope we will, we will get this programmatic uh, thinking. And my second wish is that uh, we will all join the AMR technical assistance mechanism. We have to work together. We all bring, and you see it in this uh, panel, a different experience and, and uh, expertise. Thank you, Kitty. Um, Alan, your comments? Well, it's, it's not a wish, it's an offer. Um, next year, we have the Indonesians uh, in charge of the G20, Germany in charge of the G7. And we should remember that it was during Germany's G20 in 2017, they created the, uh, the AMR uh, G20 hub. And France have the presidency of the European Union. So it's an offer to my co-panelists and those listening to, um, uh, to, to this event that we should host an event 
during the Indonesian presidency and the German and the French presidency, probably um, sometime early in March, where we bring together uh, Kitty's six points and some of the other very practical things that Dave has raised and Bill and Bill has raised. And let us uh, get the senior politicians together uh, at an event where we talk about AMR because the Indonesians tell me they're very interested in antimicrobial resistance. And I'm sure Germany is still very interested in it. And I know there's going to be a meeting of finance ministers early in February, hosted by the French presidency of the EU. So to get something concrete out of this, uh, why don't we look early in March to bring everyone together with some very concrete steps and examples and put that plan to the various presidencies of the multilateral organizations. But the one condition is we would need the WHO's help and support um, to participate in that. So I don't know, Kitty, if you want to react or respond right away, we're on the hour, but that's a, a call that uh, Alan has issued and maybe it's time to wrap up actually. So I think, just hearing the panelists, you've ended with a vision of what needs to be done. So it also gives you the confidence that it can be done. You've also highlighted the challenges that need to be addressed, starting from recognizing that um, early access to diagnostics is essential, learn from the TB model, um, look at a pipeline of robust new technologies that address issues both at the community, hospital, and at the public health system, the role of surveillance, the very important role of access, and access models that can look at both diagnostics and treatment, learning from the expertise that each organization brings and the need to have a focused funding approach. But then finally to say that can be made possible if you engage with the finance health um, leaders, the presidents, bring it into the global agenda such as G20, G7, but uh, demonstrate with concrete um, case studies and incentive so that can actually mobilize the funding to happen with a comprehensive country response. I mean, I think this is really exciting that I think we can, we have the opportunity here. And as Bill said in his comments, each organization on this panel comes with unique competencies uh, and a unique area of focus. And if we can figure out a way to work together um, because it needs more than one agency to solve this complex problem um, and break that big cube into really smaller cubes. Um, that would be a big win. This event is recorded. Um, we have some questions. We'll collect some questions that we were not able to answer and um, share that with the panelists for a response. And I think it will be posted live on uh, the FIND website and potentially on the websites um, of all the organizations if there was interest. But thank you very much again, uh, Sarah Jane and FIND um, for allowing this event to happen. And a big thank you for all the panelists who've made some invaluable contributions. And we look forward, one key message, let's not stop till we address the issue. Um, the story of Vanessa or the personal stories of all of us uh, need to be told and need to be solved. Thank you so much. Thanks, Renika. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.